Well, welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to hold this um, uh, session of the Cutting Edge series in development thinking and practice. And this afternoon, for us here in London, it's afternoon, uh, we have a really exciting uh, event tonight. Uh, it's a panel discussion around the much talked about relationship between China and uh, Africa and the various um, countries of the subcontinent of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we're especially lucky to have the three scholars that we've assembled here uh, tonight. We have uh, Deborah Braudigam, is going to be joining us, who is, who has joined us from Washington, and she'll be talking to us about why the West is getting Chinese lending in Africa so wrong. And, you know, when I had invited Deborah to talk, I said, you know, I really hope that you could continue uh, speaking about myth busting, and this is her latest myth busting. Professor Braudigam is the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC. And she's director of the China Africa Re Research Initiative is there. Um, he's author of a, a, a long list of books, The Dragon's Gift, The Real Story of China and Africa, uh, Will Africa Feed China? and uh, Taxation and State Building in Developing Countries, which was the first time I read Deborah's work um, and, and, it, and it was really pivotal to our own research uh, on, on taxation and state building. So Deborah, welcome to London. We have uh, Fauchal de Soule, um, who, who's going to be speaking to us about her really in-depth research on China's role in investment in infrastructure in Africa. Dr. Sule is a senior research associate at the Global Economic Governance Pro Program at the Belovatnik School of Government at Oxford University, and formerly an Oxford Princeton Global Leaders Fellow there. She holds a, a PhD summa cum laude in international relations from Sciences Po in France. And Fosade is joining us from uh, Lome in, in Togo, and really warmest welcome to you. Um, and then we have Dr. Shirley Yu, who will, who will talk to us about how China's activities in Africa fit in with the shifting role of China globally, uh, with a particular, um, she has particular insights on the role of Chinese com companies and, and businesses. Um, and we'll talk about them in Africa. Dr. Yu is senior visiting fellow at our own uh, Firaj Lajal Center for Africa. Uh, and she's fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and adjunct professor at IE University Business School. She's the creator of China Big Idea, which is a daily strategic briefing service on China to, to the Fortune Global Companies and Hey China, a New York-based business talk show on China. Uh, so Shirley, um, welcome from New York, um, away from the school right now, but we claim you as one of our own. So without further ado, I would like to get the panel going. Uh, as I mentioned, the speakers will speak for about, about 15 minutes each, um, and then we will open up the discussion to the audience. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. And Deborah, can I ask you to make a start? Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me to London. <laughs> I wish I was really there. It's kind of crazy in yeah. Washington right now. If you've heard anything about Chinese overseas lending over the past four years, you've undoubtedly heard the term Chinese debt trap diplomacy or seen a headline about China's secret or hidden loans. You may have heard that Chinese banks are largely responsible for Africa's debt crisis by giving high interest loans that have to be refinanced every couple of years. Just last Friday in a virtual event hosted by the Atlantic Council here in Washington, we listened to the Trump administration's national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, 
repeating Washington's script about China's predatory lending. China pushes unsustainable and opaque loans, O'Brien said. The result is the erosion of national sovereignty. On the other hand, you might've heard that China's Belt and Road Initiative is win-win. Debt write-offs are common. China is a free money machine. This was in Forbes magazine. As a Zambian economist told The Guardian, Chinese debt can easily be renegotiated, restructured, or refinanced. China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been saying for years, China never presses countries in difficulties for debt repayment. Uh, this is the paradigm of benign China. So we have malign China and benign China. As usual, the real story is somewhere in between. That's the research we've been doing at the China Africa Research Initiative since 2015. China's overseas lending in Africa presents substantial risks and it can be lose-lose. Lending, investment, even foreign aid delivered in risky environments always faces risks. The pandemic has exacerbated all of this. Over 70% of China's lending in Africa is focused on economic infrastructure, roads, bridges, electric power, telecoms. Much of this is essential for Africa's economic development, bridging the digital divide, for example. While Africa makes up only 4% of China's 2.5 trillion export market, it's over 30% of China's global construction market. Some of the more than 1,000 projects funded by China that we have in our database at the China Africa Research Initiative will be white elephants, and some will be considered failures. Furthermore, infrastructure is notorious for corruption. Yet the evidence we've analyzed on Chinese lending suggests that the fear is overblown. The level of vehemence is not matched by the evidence on malfeasance. I'm going to tell two stories that I hope illustrate a different perspective. How China is playing our game for better or for worse, and how African countries with well thought out development plans can continue to benefit from Chinese loans. So the first story, once upon a time, a large, very poor country just emerging from a period of intense conflict decided to focus on development. We need to develop our ports, they said, upgrade our mines and build power plants. And soon they had a visit from a wealthy Asian country that had already become a major consumer of their oil. We'll give you a line of credit worth $10 billion, the Asian country said. You can use this to pay for your infrastructure. Our world-class companies will build and maintain your ports, your railways, and your power plants, and you can repay us with your oil. Many people in the poor country were deeply concerned with this deal. They worried about borrowing so much, and they worried about losing their independence, but their leaders agreed and the construction began. So as I've been speaking, I hope you were wondering about which poor country I was talking about. Angola, Nigeria, Sudan, Ghana. The answer of course is the poor country was China. The year was 1978. China was a poor country just emerging from a period of intense conflict, the cultural revolution. They had a list of a hundred key infrastructure projects that they wanted to build and they didn't have the expertise or the money to do it. And the wealthy Asian power seeking to secure its oil supplies in a very risky environment where no other outside lender would venture was Japan. And just like most of China's engagement in Africa today, this line of credit was not foreign aid, but commercial. It was a business proposition. And just like most of China's engagement in Africa today, the lenders companies would do the work. Japan would win by getting business years ahead of all the Western companies that were afraid to venture into communist China. And China would win by getting modern infrastructure that it was then unable to build. The dark side of the close state business relations of Japan's developmental state was the corruption of crony capitalism. So too with China and Africa. But both China and Japan benefited from their loan arrangements for decades. So the second story is the untold story of the origins of the term Chinese debt trap diplomacy. So it's another once upon a time. Once upon a time, not so very long ago, a large and wealthy country arrived in a small tropical island nation that was just ending a 25 year civil war. Your poorest province is close to such important shipping lines, representatives from the large and wealthy country said. This is such a strategic location. We think you can develop a major port. Our leading engineering and construction firm will do the feasibility study for you for free. Many in that small tropical nation were uneasy about this arrangement and it was much debated. 
but eventually the small country agreed despite the controversies. A year later, the study was delivered. We think you should build the port, the large and wealthy country said. It's clearly feasible. It'll cost about 1.2 billion, but don't worry about the finance. We have a plan detailed in the report for how this can be a win-win outcome. I'm sure you know which port in which small tropical island nation I'm talking about, right? Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. So you probably got that right. And the large and wealthy country with the eager interest in building a major port in a strategic backwater. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It begins with a C. Got it? That's right. It was Canada. <laughs> Canada, okay. Yes, uh, this story begins more than 20 years ago in 1999. Why was Canada interested in building Sri Lanka's backwater Hambantota port in 1999? Because it would have been a hugely lucrative $1.2 billion contract for SNC-Lavalin, Canada's largest overseas engineering firm. The Canadian government was working to support the business interests of its large firms. As so often, often happens, the parliamentary election and a leadership shuffle in Sri Lanka got in the way of Canada's pursuit of the project. When the project was revived in 2005 after yet another election, one of China's largest companies went after the contract. And then it was the Chinese government that supported the business interests of its large firm. The Canadians have recommended a joint venture, a public-private partnership, what we call a boot, a build, own, operate, transfer model. But Sri Lanka, despite having very little experience, decided to try to launch and operate this major new port by themselves. This was a disaster, as we've all read. In 2017, when after yet another election, a new government came to power, Sri Lanka was facing a balance of payments crisis. And this was based on its Eurobond borrowings, not its borrowings from China. So the new government decided to privatize the controversial loss-making port to raise money. When China Merchants Port bought 70% of the shares, the port finally took the public-private partnership model that the Canadians had advised all those years ago. So how do I know all this about Canada? It wasn't easy research. I had to file a Freedom of Information Act with the Canadian government. I obtained a thousand pages of Canadian files on this project along with a feasibility study. I just got the files last month. That's why I'm kind of excited about this. <laughs> it took a year and a half. Um, meanwhile, in 2018, a hawkish Indian pundit wrote an op-ed about the sale of Hambantota and coined the term debt trap diplomacy. He implied that the whole fiasco had been orchestrated by Beijing from the beginning. Weaponizing debt was hardwired into China's Belt and Road Initiative, he argued. This interested reporters at the New York Times who relied on his analysis to write an article with the title, How China Got Sri Lanka to Cough Up a Port. Many of the most important claims in the New York Times article are surprisingly wrong. I'll just mention three. The New York Times said feasibility studies commissioned by the government had starkly concluded that a port at Hambantota was not economically viable. That's not true of the Canadian feasibility study that I obtained after a year and a half. And it's also not true of the second feasibility study, which was conducted by a Danish firm, Ramble which received a follow-on contract from the Sri Lankan Port Authority to design the master plan for the port. This is the master plan that China Harbor, the construction company, followed in building the port, not some master plan written in Beijing. Second, the New York Times said that China retired Sri Lanka's debt in exchange for securing control of the property. That's not true. This was not a debt equity swap. Sri Lanka used the foreign exchange they received in the privatization to bolster their foreign exchange reserves and pay off those euro bonds. They continued to service the debt from China, which never went into default. Most surprisingly, the New York Times wrote that, quote, the initially moderate terms for lending on the port project became more onerous. If this was true, it would surely be a case of predatory lending, but the exact opposite happened. The first Chinese loan in 2008 was at a commercial rate, negotiated at LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate plus a margin, and converted into a fixed equivalent of 6.3% when LIBOR was trending upward during the global financial crisis of 2008. Five years later, when Sri Lanka applied for new loans for phase two from China, they were at fixed rates of 2%. So the real story is that the terms got easier, not more onerous. This last part is, part is particularly important 
and has been especially well documented by Meg Rithmeyer, political scientist and China expert who holds a chair at Harvard Business School. She's written an excellent business case study on these decisions, and I hope uh, you students at LSE are able to read that case in your classes. But the New York Times reporters were apparently so convinced that China had deliberately laid a debt trap that they didn't notice that they themselves had changed the facts of the case to support their story. And two years later, the same reporting team were still misrepresenting the facts, writing, when Beijing seized a strategic seaport in Sri Lanka as collateral, debtor nations watch with concern. I went into some detail with this story because it has deeply shaped how Chinese lending has been viewed by intelligent and well-informed people in and outside of Africa. We see echoes of it in Kenyan worries that China intends to seize Mombasa port to pay the debts of Kenya's Chinese finance standard gauge railway and many other cases. But this case also shows how China in MIT professor Ed Steinfeld's words is quote, playing our game. In this case, Canada's game. Reporters and pundits come to quick conclusions without the time or the inclination or the budget to spend more than a few days or hours or at most a few weeks digging into a complicated topic. And Robert, this reminds you, me of something that you once said uh, about people who came to Taiwan to, uh, to try to figure out what was going on there, that if they spent a few days or a few weeks, uh, they, they would go back and write a book or whatever it was you said. Uh, maybe you can repeat that in, in uh, the Q&A. So, but as people like Robert or Meg Rithmeyer, C.K. Lee, Erica Downs, Lucy Corkin, Folashade Sule, myself, a number of other scholars, actually all of us are women in that list, I think, I have found spending time doing field research on Chinese lending and business practices is much more fruitful in leading to a useful understanding of how Chinese lenders and companies operate overseas and the promise and perils for both sides of risky business. So in conclusion, let me say three things. China is playing an East Asian game. And in particular, they're learning from Japan as Jap Japan became a capital exporter in the Asian neighborhood. Second, the West gets a lot wrong about Chinese lending because real concerns about Chinese over exuberant capital exports between 2008 and 2013 and debt sustainability are now deeply intertwined with the geopolitics of the US conflict. And finally, we get a lot wrong because we're only now beginning to do the hard work of deeply researching how Chinese capital operates overseas. Finally, I want to return this talk, or conclude this talk by returning to the Atlantic Council event held last Friday. There, Senegalese President Macky Sall pushed back against the American characterization of Chinese lending as predatory. Chinese people give us long-term loans, he said, at 2% interest to Robert O'Brien. We think, quote, China's non uh, excuse me, we think, quote, Africa's non-Chinese partners will gain a lot in listening, listening deeply to Africa and Africans, so, end of quote. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was, that was as usual, myth-busting. Uh, uh, Foshade, can I call on you, please? Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Professor Butzel, and for um, you know, allowing me to present my, my latest research also on, on um, Afri they say Af how Africa negotiates with China. Um, just as Deborah said a bit before, it's important to unpack you know, how uh, various actors are engaging in these uh, negotiations. And this has been my um, objective, you know, from the start uh, of this research on looking at how, what are the politics of Africa-China negotiation, and also what is the role of African actors, and also how um, do they behave, what, what type of agency do they exercise. So um, this, it's, let's say this research is at the intersection of asymmetric negotiations and African agency, and uh, it starts with um, the understanding that negotiation doesn't occur between co-equal parties, right? Or rather, it engages heterogeneous groups with different assets, with, with different legitimacy, but also with different styles of expression. Um, also, the resources are very different, right? Whether it's bureaucratic capacities, organizational skills, um, alliances, um, access to state resources, technical expertise, you know, these are distributed and mobilized unequally among competing groups, uh, sometimes within uh, a, a, 
a single government. Uh, and also uh, this whole research is about also the question of power because there are multiple power poles that exist you know, within uh, or outside the bureaucratic apparatus and they are involved, all of them are involved in doing the state both in cooperation and competition with the state. And I'll get back later uh, with uh, no more specific examples. The second uh, element here is the question of agency and African agency. So there's qu quite some literature out there, you know, on what agency is, how African agency is, is can be defined and um, exercised, but it's important to understand, you know, there's a need to identify first the actors, the specific sets of state officials that are located in specific parts of the state system, specific entities and ministries, uh, but also their resources and repertoires of action. Um, since they are differently lo located in the social structure, their exercise of agency is different also. And uh, finally, the context, right? Um, it's important also to get contextually, but also how agency is situated within the flow of time. That is the past, the present, the future. And so this has been um, the research that I've been leading uh, on, uh, well, mostly Francophone countries, Benin and Togo, where I'm based actually, but also Cameroon, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal uh, more lately. Um, so one example that I tend to take often is um, the fact that sometimes you have similar projects with different outcomes. One example of that is the Kenya versus Ethiopia railway project. You know, you have two projects here. Um, the, the, the Ethiopian one is 472 kilometers, whereas the uh, Kenyan one is much longer, but the costs vary uh, a lot, right? 3.2 billion versus 3.4. Uh, versus almost 4 billion. Uh, and the key issues at stake here, why did, for instance, Kenya get a better deal? Uh, sorry, why did Ethiopia get a better deal than, uh, than Kenya is um, to be found in the negotiation processes, you know, looking at the actors. First of all, there were key actors that were sidelined, um, the Kenyan uh, railway, um, railway, um, organization was sidelined. There was also presidential pressure, despite concerns from internal bureaucracy in terms of the feasibility study, um, a lack of consultation with grassroots communities, but also a lack of knowledge of China. And that is something that I see quite a lot in my different case studies is this uh, lack of, you know, how does China uh, negotiate. It's it's very different sometimes from uh, you know Western actors, um, and of course also the question related to corruption. So um, China is now uh, coming back to Francophone Africa. When you look at a country like Togo, where I'm now, it's important to know that many of these countries in their national development plans put infrastructure as a key priority, right? And they need funding for that. Um, China is not the first country to provide funding to, um, to, to infrastructure projects. Uh, in the 90s, the World Bank, for instance, and also European countries were providing funding, not as much as China, but at some point, various shifts in uh, terms of priority. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals came. Uh, and so let's say that the infrastructure segment became a bit underfunded. And that's where China came in with uh, much more resources uh, to provide. And also uh, let's say it's, some, uh, it's more demand driven in the sense that when China comes to various uh, African governments or ministries, they tend to ask them about their priority projects uh, more than the West does, for instance. So uh, that is uh, something very uh, important. So getting back to negotiations, um, when is it, and I can come back in more details um, during the Q&A session, but there are three variables that make a negotiation process more or less favorable to uh, an African government. Uh, first uh, is structural coordination meaning internally within uh, one government, the bureaucratic capacities, the internal coordination affect the outcome of the negotiation process. Uh, meaning that sometimes the uh, ministry, and I 
have I can share some articles uh, providing more examples, you know, in the case of Benin, for instance, within a single the same government, the Ministry of Public Works got better outcomes, better terms than the Ministry of um, of of, sorry, the Minister of Habitat got better outcomes than the Ministry of Public Works in terms of infrastructure project. And by better terms, I mean um, more um, a, a higher percentage of local content, uh, a higher percentage of, uh, you know, various, let's say, workers, African Beninese workers, but also uh, better, um, you know, uh, application or implementation of environmental and labor norms. Um, so that's the first variable, how structurally, how the negotiation teams are organized within the government. A second element is the presidency. So in many of these countries, the presidency um, exercises, you know, a very strong uh, political championship and individual agency, sometimes the president himself. In, in Benin, for instance, but also in Togo, uh, many of these, in many of these countries, you have some leaders that are very much um, they, they kind of have a certain vision or a certain view of the Chinese model that they want to emulate and reproduce locally. So they tend to um, get involved in the negotiation process, sometimes very, um, well, let's say sometimes with positive and negative outcomes. Uh, positively, uh, it can be with providing more expertise, you know, uh, to and more, um, uh, let's say, Yes, more expertise, more capacity to the negotiation teams. You know, in Benin, it can be with uh, bringing in, um, you know, expertise from China. Some uh, negotiators who are now uh, working in international law firms and who tend to work, uh, who used to work in some Chinese state apparatus, whether it's the Exim Bank, CDB, or the Ministry of Trade, or uh, meaning MOFCOM, uh, uh, also. Um, that's that can be positive on the outcomes. It can also be negative. The outcome, the intervention of the presidency can be negative when uh, it's about putting pressure on the negotiation teams to get things done uh, as fast as possible. That has been the case, whether it's in Kenya, um, whether it's in uh, sometimes in countries like um, uh, in Benin as well, uh, sometimes also uh, in Togo and in, in also in Cameroon for instance. And the reason for putting pressure on them is because many of these, uh, in many of these countries, whether they are democratic sometimes or autocratic, they have to deliver. They have to deliver to their constituencies. And uh, sometimes there are also elections coming up, whether these are local elections or presidential elections. And when that happens, uh, what happens there is that they tend to uh, ask the teams to go as fast as possible and which doesn't allow for better you know, um, implementation of uh, re regulatory norms. Um, Thirdly, uh, I think the outcome of the negotiation can also depend on the nature of the political system, the system of governance. When there's a strong civil society in countries that are more democratic than others, uh, there's, uh, they can put pressure on the government. But not only civil society, this pressure can also come from within the government. In my case study on Benin, I showed how civil servants tend to uh, transform themselves in um, you know, in, in let's say in in contestants, well, in contesting, you know, how their government uh, deals with China. So then the problem is not necessarily about China, but it's about how the government sometimes is, or the president is not providing, um, is not well helping with uh, getting better outcomes for the negotiation. That is less possible in autocratic settings, um, where you know civil society. Is, cannot uh, express a better or not get organized as they wish. And that can also constrain uh, the exercise of um, African uh, of agency. So I will conclude by saying that um, many countries are now considering uh, setting up a, a more structured China policy for African governments. Some do it better than others, like Ethiopia has a you know, a, a, a sort of a better structure, an internal unit, yeah, a China a unit with negotiators that speak Mandarin, uh, for instance. Um, the, uh, there's a problem here as well is that China operates within a parallel track, meaning that 
Um, they don't negotiate, uh, they don't coordinate uh, and harmonize their practices with duck donors, which can be a bit complicated for African governments because they have to deal with them separately. Um, but more and more, I see here that they are not, well, what they call China uh, and an African country, for instance, whether it's Benin, Togo, Senegal, Rwanda as well, uh, what they call coordination missions. Uh, that has been the case since 2015, where they discuss collectively, you know, uh, through a working group, how to better um, uh, apply norms, quality of materials, labor norms, and so on and so on. And that should apply to uh, other projects. So I will conclude by saying that advantageous outcomes are possible for African governments, despite power asymmetry. Um, the, the debate revolves more about around better internal coordinations for enhanced bargaining by African governments, but also uh, better communication and understanding of the culture and the language. Um, and finally, also, you know, it's important to say that the latest Afrobarometer re uh, results tend to say that ordinary African citizens, um, well, they do have a good appreciation of China. They think China's uh, involvement is positive, but, you know, there are also many negative aspects uh, and I think that's that's where um, there's a need for uh, African governments to take that into account and to um, make this cooperation also, um, you know, uh, profitable to all. So thank you very much. Usade, thank you very much. And it's really important to hear the diversity of experiences covering Togo and Benin and Senegal, Rwanda, Kenya. This is, you know, often missing in these discussions taken at the, 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 the macro level of Africa as a whole. Thank you very much. Um, now, if I could turn to Shirley. Um, yes. Hi. Hi, Shirley. Great. Thank you. Good day, everyone. So I'd like to uh, talk about uh, China's perspective here. I, I should say, though, uh, at the beginning, it, this is just a view, not the view. And I quite like uh, how we just finished uh, uh, the, the earlier speech. You know, there are many good and bad. And um, rather than talking about the good and bad, I'd like to talk a little bit about the future today. So China's uh, domestic and the global priorities uh, for the current decade will inevit inevitably shape uh, China's uh, future global role and the potentially uh, China and the Africa's uh, relationship within it. At the just the concluded uh, fifth plenum in Beijing this week, at the end of the meeting, China launched its uh, 14th five-year plan. And this is a uh, very routine, this is the 14th, so very routine, the short term, I should say, uh, economic policy planning for China. But uh, this year, very rarely on top of the 14th five-year plan, China also launched a 15-year long vision called the Long Vision 2035. And so this Long Vision 2035, in a nutshell, it states that China will reach what's called the socialist modernity by 2035. Well, now, um, as uh, traditionally always done in Chinese political discourses, uh, there is no way for a Western uh, a, a scholarly community to really um, be able to pinpoint what exactly does uh, socialist modernity really mean. But the policy interpretation from the Chinese uh, policy community is that uh, China's a real per, uh, per capita GDP, and as a consequence, uh, China's GDP in aggregate will double again from 2020 to 2035. And so we know that uh, um, with a slight margin of error because of COVID-19, China's uh, GDP, both in aggregates and in uh, uh, per capita, uh, on per capita basis has already doubled from 2010 level by 2020. And so essentially uh, China will double it again in the next 15 years. And I think this will mean profound changes for China and the world. And just uh, uh, let's look at the world in general. This year, China's GDP with a comfortable degree of certainty now will likely surpass that of the EU 27 members combined. And so given the current economic forecast before 2035, China's uh, leading uh, economist, uh, Justin Yifulin, who was former World Bank chief economist and currently the Chinese president's advisor, he said that by 2030 or so, China 
on a, a GDP aggregate basis on the nominal level will surpass uh, the economy of the United States to become the largest economy in the world. And I think uh, now, you know, the world is engulfed with economic uncertainty, but just to give it a little bit of a modesty, uh, perhaps uh, the 2035 uh, benchmark where China is saying, you know, or are benching, benchmarking everything towards, that's probably the timeline where we're looking at possibly an economic parity status between China and the United States. But uh, it's uh, certainly not just the China's economic size that matters to the world. And I think the underlying economic structural transformation that matters even more profoundly for the developing world and uh, Africa included. So in the long vision 2035, China has called for innovation this time as a key driver of uh, China's economic growth. Uh, China's Vice President uh, Wang Qishan earlier mentioned that China has to go away from uh, this uh, uh, traditional way of uh, the economic growth model being led by traditional factors of production uh, from labor to land to capital, et cetera, not to fundamentally move into innovation. So innovation is going to be a major area of uh, collaboration between China and Africa going forward. And I'll explain later. So China in the midst of this uh, US-China uh, geopolitical uncertainty uh, has called for self-reliance in uh, particularly the key technological areas. And so China has uh, within this long vision 2035 phrased it as a balance between self-reliance and uh, opening up. So China will also in response to the US be moving supply chains closer to home. Uh, so that's not a unilateral action by the US. Obviously, you know, the two epicenters of global economies are both doing the same things. So now China, given this uh, economic structure, uh, it no longer has the labor premium that it used to have, and it doesn't really have the demographic, uh, sorry, demographic premium. So as China moved up uh, on this uh, global value chain to compete head to head on the top end of the global value chain with that of the United States, the middle to lower end of China's supply chain, we inevitably have to be shift, uh, shifted to the more emerging emerging economies than China. And obviously uh, right at China's uh, doorstep, uh, China is moving uh, and will be continuing to move uh, a lot of manufacturing capacity to the ASEAN nations, but on a longer term and more st uh, strategic uh, level, China is looking at Africa. And the third aspect in China's long vision 2035 and that's of uh, significant relevance is uh, China's call to turn China from a world's uh, factory to the world's market to satisfy the consumer demand of this increasing middle income population in China uh, that's currently at 400 million, but soon will double to 800 million by 2035 as well. So Africa's uh, cross-border e-commerce trade has picked up very rapidly with uh, companies uh, such as Alibaba's presence in Africa, but uh, traditional trade as well. So it'll uh, feature not only, uh, uh, we will see in the future that not only African companies uh, will be selling uh, to China uh, products and uh, you know um, uh, from Af by that's made by African companies, but also increasingly by Chinese uh, foreign direct investment in Africa. Uh, so the Chinese companies are going to directly invest there to build up the production capacity in order to satisfy China's increasing demands. So I'll talk about innovation uh, to start with. Let me uh, just uh, I'd like to show a couple of quick charts. So this is our world over two millennia. Everything started to happen right here around the industrial revolution. So that's what Kuznet said. Uh, the understanding about uh, the difference of rich countries and poor countries is a very recent phenomenon. It's only happened in the, uh, at the onset of the industrial revolution. And this is uh, the different countries at different uh, curves uh, as they started to embrace on this uh, industrial revolution as we see that China is so somewhere around here, uh, below world average, uh, somewhere in the lower uh, uh, half there. But uh, we see that the uh, United States, United Kingdom, at the time when they uh, embraced, um, became the early adopters of uh, cutting edge of global technology. So we saw a, a immediate economic takeoff for these countries um, against the rest of the world. And so the technological uh, adaptation by a country will give the country a significant economic takeoff opportunity 
against the rest of the global economies. And this is really revealing. The green chart is actually uh, uh, United States. And so as we see when the United States and United Kingdom started to embrace on um, technological innovations, the rest of uh, the uh, developing economies that are falling behind in uh, embracing technologies, they not only fall behind on a relative basis against the early adopters of technology, they fall behind on an absolute basis. This is uh, over essentially uh, in the early industrialization period. And so if we look at it, the early trading economies are from China to India to Mexico over the 18th century, uh, let's remember China was um, a very rich country uh, in terms of his GDP in the 18th century, actually one sixth of the global GDP at a time. But we saw that as the um, early industrializers starts to economically take off, these uh, ancient trading economies, they started to, on a real per capita GDP basis, they started to fall on their uh, welfare standards. And so this really brings something that's quite profound, I think, to the innovation, particularly as it relates to Africa. It's in the sense that, uh, China's involvement uh, in the country will give uh, the emerging world, and of course, Africa included as a, a quintessential part of it, this uh, economic takeoff opportunity by simply uh, becoming the early embracers of the next wave of global cutting edge technology. So Jack Ma recently said in a conference uh, at the Bounce Summit last weekend, he said uh, the traditional understanding that China is going to catch up with the West and then hopefully eventually surpass the West. That whole conventional wisdom is actually wrong because China does not need to meet itself with the West. China only needs to meet um, itself directly with the future. So China needs to find where the future lies, what uh, future opportunities are, and then synchronize the economic development model to meet the future opportunities. And so Jack Ma is simply saying, well, China, uh, is not going to catch up with the West and then bypass, or uh, sorry, then surpass. China is just going to simply bypass the West. And so China already, um, according to Jack Ma, that uh, you know, China finds the Western uh, economic experience already dated. And um, not only uh, the, you know, he described uh, the Western economic system, uh, the Bazo system in particular, uh, as a old person and the Chinese system as a uh, adolescent. And so you cannot uh, give the adolescent the same prescription uh, that's given to an old person that will cause more problems than the very problem that it's trying to address. And so China simply uh, is going to take off on this, uh, you know, by saying China is going to directly meet the future itself. Um, it's just China is just simply going to find an alternative development path altogether, led by these uh, uh, technological areas that China is quite advanced in, particularly in telecom infrastructure and the fintech development. And so Africa today has a relatively weak industrial base, uh, relatively weak financial system, weak infrastructure. And in a way, uh, it's very similar to where China got started uh, 40 years ago. So China with its uh, current uh, technological know-how can take Africa to uh, share that experience of bypassing the developed world experience of the 20th century altogether and also directly meet with the future. And so in telecom infrastructure, as an example, it is 5G that will change uh, the African development future, not only because uh, we earlier said that whoever becomes an early adapter of uh, cutting edge technology will uh, embrace on a major economic takeoff, but we can also uh, take a look at uh, what China is specifically doing with this current uh, 5G technology here. So this is a, a graph that I've uh, drafted as of the end of 2019. So if we look at uh, the blue line, those are the number of uh, BRI contracts, the Belt and Road Initiative contracts that China has signed with countries in different continents. And so we can see that Africa is run, uh, ranked uh, right on the top there with the most uh, highest number of con uh, BRI uh, agreements. And of course, I must mention that BRI agreements are, a lot of them are non-binding. But uh, if we look at the orange line, that is actually Huawei's uh, presence uh, in each continent. And I also have to make a disclaimer here. Uh, the number that we track with Huawei just simply says, if for example, in Africa, it just simply says that uh, these uh, many countries in Africa has not 
expressively said we are going to reject Huawei from the country's 5G networks. And so it simply means a no ban scenario for Huawei. But if we look at these two charts, we don't really need a uh, uh, empirical modeling tool, they closely track each other. So they are highly correlated. And so we could say that Huawei is a quintessential part of uh, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative and uh, this uh, China's uh, global uh, infrastructure and uh, expansion strategy. And so uh, Huawei's expansion and uh, China's BRI expansion are essentially one and together. And so now I call it a BRI 2.0 because we just earlier talked about uh, the BRI 1.0, which is a lot of uh, traditional infrastructure building, the rails, roads, ports, et cetera. Yes, China did a lot of that in Africa as well. But those are the infrastructures that were necessary for the 20th century. But uh, in, China is obviously moving into the 2.0 phase to start to expand the digital infrastructure network. Not only as we saw so much in the global headline, it's uh, China's uh, additional uh, infrastructure building efforts in uh, Europe, in the developed world, but actually much more uh, in the developing world. And so why China embraces on the BRI 2.0 in building digital infrastructure? Uh, there are two economic rationales. Um, the first one is if a country has a dollar, and has only one dollar, and the country can choose to invest this dollar into traditional infrastructure or uh, invest it into digital infrastructure, well, if the country chooses to put it in digital, the, per, uh, the economic output is actually 1.2 times higher than traditional infrastructure. And so it makes sense that China is more focusing on the digital infrastructure, the infrastructure of the 21st century. Now, the second uh, uh, economic rationale is actually directly from the World Bank, which is the chart we're showing here, is that a 10% uh, uh, increase in technological budget in the country. If we look at the developing world, if they increase their technological budget by 10%, the uh, percentage of economic growth for the developing country will be significantly higher than a 10% technological investment increase for a developed country. And so we could see that in the fixed network, mobile network, internet, and broadband in all telecom categories. Uh, for 10% increase for a country, the developing world will always see a higher economic output than the developed world. And so that then that completes the rationale that China, why China today is more focused on digital infrastructure and why China is primarily focusing on the developing world, as we see here quite clearly in Africa, in Asia, and uh, the rest of the developing economies. So in, uh, in uh, the 40% of uh, African population currently is under the age of 20. It's a young dynamic continent. Africa has been the fastest uh, uh, region in terms of uh, the growth in mobile broadband networks and the smartphone users. So Alibaba has been building huge initiatives in Africa today to not only build up the e-commerce presence by uh, e e uh, enhancing this uh, cross-border e-commerce trade between Africa and China, but also uh, Alibaba is taking Alipay there, which is China's uh, fintech uh, third-party payment processing platform. And so by taking it there, before Africa has a robust banking presence on the continent, Africa will be moving just like China directly to the fintech age. And so now with uh, the broadband infrastructure, that is the infrastructure that would e essentially allow the fintech applications and the entire digital economy, if we wanted to have a shared economy, we need a very robust uh, broadband infrastructure network in Africa. And so uh, the fintech developments and the uh, digital economy will flourish on this uh, broadband infrastructure. And so Africa will have an opportunity, I think, to possibly have to, uh, you know, throughout the world development history uh, to, to essentially uh, welcome the first opportunity to become an early adopter of uh, global technology and to welcome that uh, economic takeoff against uh, this time the developed world. And so now the second thing I talked about was uh, China's uh, supply chain recalibration. And I know a lot of the global emphasis on China has been uh, about China's debt trap in Africa and elsewhere. But uh, I think less attention has been paid on China's uh, foreign direct investment in Africa. And so if I may show the chart once again. Uh, 
So uh, this is a BRI uh, global total. It's just we run through this 725 billion, roughly, and in Sub-Saharan Africa about 125, uh, 155, billion, and in the uh, MENA region about another. 100 billion. So this is the chart I'd like to show. This is actually from Johns Hopkins. And so we could see it's quite obvious that China's FDI in Africa continues to rise. And look at the US FDI. That, that becomes a quite a um, obvious scenario for a country, uh, for a continent that desperately needs uh, investment and the growth opportunities. And so um, now talking about China's FDI, uh, as of uh, 2018, over 70% of uh, the direct investments in Africa now are conducted by Chinese private companies, companies like Alibaba we just talked about, and also this company called Transient Techno. This is a Chinese a smartphone maker that is based in Shenzhen in China, right you know, next door to Huawei. But uh, if you ask a Chinese, no one has heard of Transient Techno. It sells zero phones in China. No one has heard about it. But uh, they own currently 34% of uh, Africa's smartphone market share. When I had uh, a chat with uh, our African colleagues uh, at the LSC, they said, oh yes, it's everywhere on the street corner. And so this is the typical story of uh, made in China. It's become so specialized and so localized to the extent that it's hardly recognizable as a uh, Chinese brand anymore. So now over the past 40 years, uh, China has managed to build a very robust uh, global supply chain and build itself into the world's factory. So it has a, a fairly complete uh, global supply chain capacity. Uh, at home in China, but China is currently weak on the top end of the chip making as a typical example, but China is very strong in the middle to lower end of the global value chain creation. So China now no longer as mentioned has uh, uh, the labor uh, premium that it once had. China is supercharging into an aging society. In 2018, that was the tipping point when China had more people leaving the job force than people joining. Now by 2050, China will have a median age of 51 years old. That'll be far older than uh, the median age at the time of the United States or the EU. So that is a dire issue. China became old before China became rich. And uh, that process of aging, it's so much quicker as well in comparison to the rest of the OECD, uh, to the current OECD economies. And so the um, other aspect is that China no longer has the cost advantage. And so if China were to double uh, as uh, according to the Long Vision 2035, uh, the per capita GDP again by 2035, China will be in a solid high income country category. And not only a high income, but actually on, in the middle uh, range of the high income category. And so that means production cost would be so expensive, it would make absolutely no sense for uh, much of the uh, middle to lower end of the production capacity to happen in China. So African continent owns the world's youngest and growing labor force. And so what we see today is a lot of the smart money and the manufacturing companies, uh, consumer electronics, machinery, uh, agricultural food processing, they are um, you know, no longer making the products and trying to sell the products from China to Africa. They invest in Africa instead, and they make the products directly in Africa for Africa and maybe sell them back to China. And so um, they are now investing locally, building up the not only the manufacturing capacities in Africa, they are hiring local workers, they are bringing China's know-how and the skill sets, and they are training uh, Africans uh, uh, young labor force. And so it would be more cost efficient for Chinese companies if they successfully do so. Because uh, in looking at the next 15 years, you got to start early to uh, build up the presence and the build up the, the, the uh, build up the capacity for growth. So the birth rates uh, continues to rise in Africa, which is essentially, you know, what China no longer has, and but what China had 40 years ago. And today, uh, we're just seeing that trend, essentially how China's whole development experience from virtually nothing uh, on a very large continent uh, with a very long coast, you know, that whole experience seems to be replicating in Africa. And so China's uh, leading uh, economic uh, priority also incorporates uh, turning China from the world's factory to the world's market. And so China today uh, has 400 million middle class, will soon become 800 million in 15 years time. The products that are produced in Africa 
uh, will be made in Africa, uh, possibly by Chinese investments or African indigenous companies in Africa, but uh, being supplied increasingly to Chinese consumers. And so Africa with Chinese investments, uh, particularly in these uh, very uh, strong areas that China and Africa can find this compatibility in manufacturing auto parts. Today, uh, there's a lot of talks about auto parts, uh, textile and smartphone manufacturing, we just talked about and agricultural processing facilities. All of these will help uh, Africa uh, against uh, the conventional uh, criticisms, I should say, about China over a period of time. I think uh, it'll train African labor force to become more skilled because 40 plus years ago, Chinese labor force were not skilled either. And so the, uh, the one more thing is on agriculture and energy security for China. During the Long Vision 2035, China did also mention that agricultural security is uh, the key of all key tasks. That's uh, uh, in a way that that language is unprecedented. So um, this year, China faces a lot of uh, agricultural pressure, not only because of the US trying to face one trade deal, but also just uh, more structurally, because in China, if we just look at the infl inflation figures, in 2020, uh, this, you know, with COVID-19, it should be a very deflationary environment. So China's uh, pork price has gone up 80% in Q2, and I think it's just come down to some 20% inflation in Q3. And China's food inflation altogether is uh, over 20%. That's a lot of pressure for the uh, middle to lower income uh, households in China. So China does need a massive energy intake and in agricultural trade, not only uh, just for commercial reasons, but uh, for China's uh, stri uh, strategic purposes. And so two additional things I'd like to briefly mention just for to open up questions later, is uh, that uh, China needs uh, Africa's uh, political support on the um, global stage, particularly when it comes to these uh, global 20th century multilateral organizations. So when you add nearly 60 countries, 60 votes at the UN or any multilateral organizations, it significantly boosts China's presence there. And the other thing is on education exchange. Um, China is currently offering massive and lucrative scholarships uh, for African students to study in China. And so when these students, I, when I um, went back to China, you know, African students are everywhere in the top universities uh, uh, throughout China, and they read from uh, uh, Confucius to Xi Jinping thought. And so what these students, uh, these are the future leaders of Africa. And I think what they believe in fundamentally, what shapes their, um, their soft power understanding of the world will be fundamental in understanding where Africa is going in the future. Do these uh, future leaders of Africa believe in Confucianism, believe in Xi Jinping thought, or do they believe in Plato or Immanuel Kant? And I think that matters a great deal for the future world. And I think uh, China has been weak in uh, uh, its uh, global soft power. China has a lot of uh, economic uh, power, the hard power. But uh, I think Africa, ironically, is actually an exception, just like uh, what our earlier presenter said. Uh, by and large, a lot of Africans, they welcome China. They see China as a benign partner in Africa. And I, th I think that is uh, sort of the general impression that we uh, get from uh, underground in China by these African students as well. And I think it is particularly these African students that in 20 years, 30 years time, they're going to run the continent and how they think and perceive the world uh, will be fundamental. And so um, I think I should stop here and uh, leave uh, the soft power discussions to the Q&A. Shirley, thank you very much. Uh, and especially for your account of the role of technology and technological innovation um, and speaking towards the future and future trends. I'm going to change our idea slightly because um, Deborah called on Robert Wade <laughs> for a comment. And very brief, Robert, but, um, while we're still live, um, why don't you ask your comment, uh, ask your question or make a short comment, and then we'll go to, um, to the panel for very brief response and then we'll pass on to the Q&A students. Robert, are you there? Yes, okay, um, so I have three questions. One of them is about the great problem of China possibly growing old before it becomes rich. 
So the question is, is the government um, uh, proposing or has it already laid out uh, incentives uh, on couples to have more children? Uh, the question is, what is the population policy um, that the government is mounting to address this problem? What about immigration, for example? Are there implications for China's immigration policy uh, of this dilemma? growing old before becoming rich. That's point question number one. Question number two is about the the huge, as I understand it, um, regional variation in labor costs, in particular between the East and the West. My understanding is that labor costs out in the West, in Qinghai, for example, but in the other Western provinces, labor costs are still much lower than in the um, East. And I would have thought that this would be an incentive for industry to move out west um, in addition to moving to Africa or other um, uh, places outside of uh, China. So that's a question. Do you, are, are we seeing a move of industry um, in China out to the west to take advantage of lower labor costs? And the third question is about Southeast Asia, because over the past several decades, there have been dense global or rather regional value chains built between Southeast Asia, um, manufacturing components, which were then shipped to China for assembly, and then the products sent on to Europe and the United States. The question is, if China is making this great big push into Africa, what are the effects of this push on um, these uh, regional value chains and on the economies of the countries that were supplying China with uh, components um, in the past? Those are three questions. Robert, thank you very much. Could I, could I turn to the speakers, back to the panel, just for maybe a two minute response each, and then we're going to um, go off air and into the Q&A. And in the meantime, if students could begin to type their questions into the chat, that would be great. Just to unmute. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I really would like to get to the questions, but I'll just say first that what a pleasure it was for me to be able to learn from two two such uh, knowledgeable panelists, and I, I really I love this, um, and that's one of the great joys about coming to the London School of Economics. I look forward to those students' questions too. Um, I, I wanted to just emphasize again how important uh, Fulashadi's uh, points about uh, Africa is not a country. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of different countries and they're, they're all uh, engaging differently in different ways. And it's fascinating to see that and, and her work is, is pointing that out so well. And I would just add to that, and this relates to some of what Shirley said, that, that China is a country, but it's not one China. And so we need to disaggregate China as well. Uh, in our database, for example, we have 30 different Chinese lenders. Uh, they engage in different ways. They're now doing debt relief in different ways. Um, in China studies, we call this, uh, China is a system of fragmented authoritarianism. And we can see that uh, working now, and I'm sure uh, Fola has been seeing that in her research too, that, that the uh, people she's working with and studying uh, in Africa are not just engaging with China. <laughs> Yeah. engaging with different Chinese entities as well. So we have to disaggregate China as well as Africa. Thanks. Thank you very much. Foshade. Mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. It, it has also been a very great listening to uh, both Shirley and, and Deborah. I think maybe to the question related to, to labor. Well, um, it's something that I didn't mention in in my uh, in my presentation, but it's also important, and I think that um, Carlos Oya did that very well in, yeah. in a research paper on looking at the different labor regimes in China uh, and how they uh, can explain why in Africa it's sometimes better. Uh, so, so sorry, it's sometimes easier for some governments to get um, you know better deals when negotiating. Uh, with Huawei, for instance, in the telecom sector, then uh, in the infrastructure uh, 
sector because the la the labor regimes um, in China are also uh, very much different one from the other. So it's actor specific, but it's also sector specific. So that's also very important to take into account. Um, Thank you, Foshade. Uh, very briefly, Shirley. <laughs> I, I find these uh, questions fascinating. Thank you, Robert. So the first one on the uh, family planning policies. In 1978, China started this uh, uh, interventional policy uh, called one child policy. So each family can have one child in a family. So I'm a one child generation. And so uh, fast forward to 2015, that's the moment when China officially uh, turned one child policy to two child policy. And so he's saying that now uh, every family can have up to two children. But I think uh, quite to the government's surprise, there were shocks that uh, uh, 2017 to 2018 to 2019, the new birth rates in China continues to slide both in the firstborn and in the secondborn categories. And so Chinese uh, young children, millennials don't wanna have more children. I think the government didn't anticipate that. And so uh, a lot of it is cost related because when uh, somebody wants to have a child, um, they need uh, one more bedroom in their apartment. And China's uh, real estate has been skyrocketing over the past two decades or so, education costs. And don't forget, when China had this uh, inverted pyramid model, you know, for, for grandparents, uh, two parents and one child, then essentially they had more older families to take care of uh, in a society where you know, the young does take care of the old financially and physically because there is not a very robust and sophisticated uh, social welfare and uh, uh, healthcare system to support uh, yet. And so um, a lot of cause concerns and young children don't really by and large have this enthusiasm. So here's the question, the government can control, you, you cannot have more than two children, but the government doesn't know how to say you have to have more than two more, ch uh, more than two children now. And so the incentives, a lot of people say you got to give women more equal job opportunities because uh, statistically, if women feel more secure at their jobs, they feel like having, uh, they feel more secure to have more children in the uh, education infrastructures, uh, social welfare, healthcare all of that, but uh, we don't know. So now not only the sociologists, but economists in China are saying, well, let's open up as quickly as possible because that's the only way to slow down the aging process. Uh, so, but we, we still haven't heard any official announcement yet. My understanding is that the government is slowly changing possibly to a step of, uh, you know, somebody's uh, leading economist is calling for a three child policy. To me, that's just uh, simply transitory. You know, China should really just, you know, let uh, people who want to have more children have uh, while they can. Uh, Thank that's you, Shirley. Shirley. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to be able to move on to the students' questions and you could come back again. For Absolutely. Thank you. At this point, we're about to end our broadcast to the public, and I just want to remind you that while there's no uh, session next week, on the 13th November, we'll, we'll have Branko Milanovic, and he'll be talking to his most recent book, and I invite you all to rejoin us on, on, on the 13th November at 4 p.m. London time.